Good evening. Kia ora tato and welcome. My name's Teresa Turner from New Plymouth District Council and I'm just going to read a short, brief safety announcement. Um, in the unlikely event of an emergency, please follow the instructions of council staff who will make themselves known to you. Please exit through the main entrance and when you reach the footpath, turn right and walk towards Pukikura Park, congregating outside the Spark building. Please do not block the footpath for other users. Staff will then guide you to an alternative route if necessary. If there is an earthquake, drop, cover and hold where possible. Please be mindful of the beautiful glass overhead in that occasion and please remain where you are until further instruction is given. And just on a housekeeping note, toilets are located in the foyer to the right with the emergency exits. Thank you for listening to that. I will now, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Trent and Martin to open our proceedings with a kalakia. Ake aro no tātou katoa, ko rangi nui te atua ko papatua nu ko te wahine, ka tuku takawihi atua, ka tuku takawihi he tangata ki te ki te whai au ki te aumarama. Ko rangi nui e tū nei ko papatua nu ko e takoto nei ngā mihi ki a koutou. Ko rua taranaki te maunga, ko rātou ko ia te pau o tātou te iwi te atiawa nui tonu, te iwi o Rua Taranaki e tūnei. Nō reira kia koutou i ngā mate haere, haere, haere. Mā koutou oki ngā manu hiri tuarangi, koutou mā ki o ngā motu. Ngā mihi atu kia koe e te rangatira ta koromatua o ki o ngā motu. Koutou mā ta kaunihera hoki o ki o ngā motu hoki. Nō reira kia koutou tēnā koutou. Nau mai, haere mai, I roto i te rohe o Ngāti te whiti, te hapū. Nō reira kia koutou, ka huri anau ki te reo prāwa mā koutou ki te mōhio. Welcome, extensive people from all around. I can't say just in New Plymouth because we have nationalities amongst us all from all around the world. So welcome once, twice, thrice times to our rohe or the district of Ngāmotu, in the district of our hapu of Ngāti Te Whiti. And welcome with amongst our iwi. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all um, at this uh, auspicious hui and with all our wisdom that we're going to put together and put it to the board. Hoi no ka koutou mā and welcome to our, like, our, our, our mayor. And it's good to see you, Neil, again, and our councils. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, koutou mā, huri nō tapontu, te nā koutou, te nā koutou, kia ora nō tātou katoa. Te aroha, te wakapono, me te rangi mari e. Nō reira e aku rauranga tira mā I laro i te mana o te matua whaia tama wairu a tapu makotua ne hira pono E whakawetei ene ki ako e te ariki mō uma nā ki tanga ki runga ki a mātau e mō tēnei wā Mō āke, āke āke, āmene Kia ora tātou Thank you, Trent. And before I hand over to Mayor Neil Holden to lead us through the proceedings this evening, we've just put together a short highlights video which shows some of the investment that we at Council make in our CBD to just give you a flavour of the kind of things we do. So, hand over to my trusty assistant. <laughs>
Sharon. Uh, my name is Neil Holder. Um, and um, first of all, I'm just stoked with the room. This, this is awesome. We were just talking about energy and, and the people that are really going to drive the future of our district. And you know, I said, oh, Sean and I and Alan Melody were discussing um, the, this, this kind of CBD revitalization work and, and talking about how we how we might um, engage and we thought, oh yeah, we'll probably get 10 or 15 people might turn up if we're lucky. Um, so boom, here we go. Um, just to set some background, after the election, um, the, the, the council of 2016 got together and we said, what are our priorities? And one of our top 10 priorities was our CBD. Now when we, when we describe the CBD, it's not just limited to New Plymouth CBD because we've obviously got Waitara, we've got Awakura, we've got Englewood, we've got Okato, um, but it was really about that those those urban focal points. Um, we've, as you've seen, um, probably read the paper over the last couple of years. We've, we've gone through an LTP process, so we've set a ten-year budget. Um, we've we've put a big focus on infrastructure and resilience. But there's a lot of work to be done. And um, I recall actually I was invited um, to an event um, right at the start of of the term. Um, up, up in the White Heart upstairs and talked about this idea of council as, as being an enabler, providing this platform. And, and really what I, what I said at the time, I think still holds true, we draw a little sketch about where we think people are going to go and where we think the infrastructure is going to go based on all the information we have today. And then we develop that. But it is you the businesses, you the, the property owners, you the entrepreneurs, um, you the citizens that actually colour that in and add in a lot of the detail. Um, we are primarily an infrastructure enabler, a coordinator, a strategic planner, um, but in terms of implementation um, and in terms of feeding into that strategy and in terms of making things happen, it's got to be a three-way relationship between council, between all of the businesses, etc., trading, and then the people who go into these places and actually bring them to life. And so this is um, the start of a conversation about what do we want to achieve as a community over the next 30 years. Now, um, when, we, when we went back to right at the beginning, what are we going to do? Um, there are some people that put their hands up as our CBD champions. Um, and they are Sean Bessick, who was here with me, who has for many years been working to drive progress in the Plymouth District and also Alan Melody who like me um, came in in the class of 2016. Um, so the goal in, in starting this conversation is that we develop a collaborative process whereby the council and its community and its investment community develops a shared sense of direction of where we're going to go, identifies the investments that are going to need to be made to achieve the outcomes that we want to deliver. I think um, if what does success look like to me, well, success looks like that this is an ongoing conversation where we co-create the future. Um, and, and my last, um, I suppose the last thing I have to say is, so it's up to us to think about what we're going to do and um, be careful what you think because thoughts control your life. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand over to someone who's far cleverer than me, um, uh, Mr. Liam Hodges. Um, kia ora koutou everyone, um, kia karahi, kia kanui. Um, so my job is to set the context uh, for tonight. Um, since 2004 uh, we've been focusing on the CBD. Um, of course some of you may remember the New Plymouth District Blueprint. Um, one of its key focus areas again was, was the CBD and the success of it. We had a particular focus on improving how we manage the CBD, in particular the public realm, the spaces that the community move through, and including that, supporting it with programs, events, programming, um, activities, and continuing to support the owners, particularly of heritage buildings, and we all know the challenges that they face, and that's um, increased, I suppose, with the earthquake issues and the earthquake strengthening matters that affect a lot of property owners around the cities of New Zealand. So that took the shape of shaping a city action plan. And in 2016, um, we developed that um, and we deployed those initiatives out into the CBD. And Juliet's going to talk a little bit about it tonight. Um, as part of that action plan, we commenced the events program through the events team here at New Plymouth District Council 
um, what they call the said in the city events. And that was in the 17-18 financial year. It's quite a substantial amount of money was made available to allow us to maximise the peak season um, that you see the city celebrate summer in, which includes, of course, WOMAD, Americana and um, the Tattoo Festival. So by the end of 2021, we'll have um, approximately $550,000 invested in the vibrancy of the CBD, starting from $300,000 last year. And that's ramping up to both fund OPEX and CAPEX initiatives in the city as we try to imagine what the future looks like. Um, added to that, of course, is the proposed district plan. Um, and that's a key regulatory document um, that this district needs and by law requires every 10 years to be reviewed. That's due to be notified mid next year. We've already been through one round of consultation and Julia again will touch on um, some of the high level policy initiatives that relate specifically to that, that document. We've taken a top down approach um, in planning for the CBD and um, it also is an integrated one. So uh, Richard Mothwell from our policy team will also take us through a quick five minutes on um, the earthquake prone building issue um, that pervades, of course, across the district, but in particular how it relates to the CBD. So this work, as we all know, council in particular, we can't do this alone. Um, it's important that partnership, as Neil's already indicated, co-creating with property owners, shop owners, uh, investors, uh, community and business groups and landowners will be the key uh, to success in the future because it is a really hard road ahead and we are running into some reasonably substantial headwinds both economically and also through the changing face of retail. So CBDs across um, the Western world is ch are changing, and particularly in regional centres. Um, so that's my message, that's my context setting. I'm going to hand it over to uh, Juliet Johnson now, who's going to take you through some of the district plan, and then Richard will talk a little um, on earthquake-prone buildings. So kia ora koutou. So Liam's given you a bit of an overview of the journey so far um, in, in terms of our strategic framework and our strategic planning framework and where that's going. Um, we're working under that vision set by the Mayor in terms of um, creating the lifestyle capital um, and those pillars that we have under that in terms of key outcomes that the Council is working towards um, in terms of um, place prosperity and people. So just in, there we have it. So that's our plan on a page, effectively, in terms of our strategic plan for this council. Um, this will help guide our decision making. And I'll just talk to some of the um, key directions also below there, which Liam highlighted when he talked about the blueprint work. And I know there's many people in this room, because this was a co-design process, I suppose, with um, the community. We, many of you would have been involved in some of this back in 2015. Where some key issues really started to pop for the council, I think, as it was looking at how it could actually work in a more integrated way between those social, economic and environmental matters. And out of that came um, eight key directions, and one of those relating to the central city, which is obviously the topic that we're all here to talk about today, and championing a central city for all. So this was about um, putting the central city, I suppose, front and centre, in terms of it being the place and the hub for business activity in the district. And we all know that we've seen some of the spread now um, going to other areas. So it's recognising those issues and looking how we can manage that and change with that changing face of those trends. So it's really how the blueprint recognises how we can work with you, as Liam said, to work on those solutions. So as part of that work in 2015, um, we then picked it up and considered, well, how can we actually start working with our community on these issues? So we went and tested them with some of our developers and um, investors in the CBD with a focus group um, approach to actually help us identify some of those key priorities um, that were effectively packaged as a shape in our city action plan. So this was our 2016 um, journey. So you'll see there we've got the concepts of greening the city. And this is actually how we manage our public spaces and our public realm, as, as Liam mentioned. So you can see things, um, as I'll show you soon, in terms of feature seating and some of the actual practical things the council um, was looking to do with, or has, and has achieved within um, looking at how it delivers to its community. There was light up the laneways, which is about activation of that public space. 
um, to make them safe and encourage their use. Um, painting the city, so this is looking after our heritage, as Liam mentioned, and our buildings, and focusing our funding into that, that key, those key areas of the CBD and how we can help, again, with that connection with the public realm. And then um, there's some others there in terms of city design and postcode 34310. So it gives me, um, and this is some of the, I suppose, the action points that you can see that's happened since that 2016 time. Um, where you can see some of the deliverables. And I know that soon we'll get um, quite a, a, a quite a depth, in-depth um, discussion in terms of it in the city and understanding some of the programming that's happened there. So I'll just now go um, onto our draft district plan and give you a very quick overview of, I suppose, where that direction is going in terms of the central city. So this was um, went out as a draft in February this year with some very big changes in policy direction for the council. And it had a big focus on inserting, um, in, um, on providing more certainty for investment and better outcomes. So it's really changing from our current very laissez-faire, effects-based process to a more directive process with the outcomes and the end point in mind. So for the CBD, that means that we want to actually encourage and build that business confidence in the CBD by actually directing activities directly into that area. So the district plan is one of those, I suppose, our regulatory powerhouse in terms of how the council can use that lever, lever to influence those outcomes. So we talk about in the CBD um, in the district plan being the go zone. So it's our hub, it's our regional and district hub for activities where you will get the mix of entertainment, office and retail but we also focus retail and office activities into the CBD. So that's where we want to see um, those, those activities focused um, so that they can actually sustain that sort of CBD life. And we want to, um, and this has come through quite a bit in the feedback we've received so far on the plan, is well-designed um, buildings, particularly with that interaction with the public realm again at the streetscape. And we want that CBD as an outcome to be vibrant and full of activity. And part of that puzzle is also, um, and I know it's something that many people talk about, living in the CBD and getting residents in there and around to actually support it moving forward. And I'll just touch now very quickly as a lead into Richard's next discussion, um, our heritage, because part of what we do in the district plan is we look after what's important. And you think about heritage and maybe um, our location on the coast, for example, where that is actually our point of difference for our CBD that we can actually add value um, to the wider pro um, proposal. So this is just highlighting how the council has a role in terms of um, assisting private owners to preserve heritage value in their buildings. And um, we use our Heritage Protection Fund. We've recently um, rolling out consideration in terms of our um, facade enhancement grants. So there's a lot in this space that's involving that we're, we're keen to keep working with. So I'll just now pass you on to Richard Moforth, who will give a, um, an outline on um, earthquake-prone buildings. Thanks, Juliet. Um, I'm just here to give you a, um, a couple of minutes on a really high-level overview of uh, the new earthquake-prone building framework and national system that came into effect last year. Um, so as I said, the new system, the new national system came into effect last year. Before that, the council had its own policy and process about how it would manage earthquake prone buildings in the district. Um, the diagram on the left shows the factors that the government took into account when um, creating its framework and the components that were produced in the framework you can see on the right. There's legislative changes, new regulations for various factors methodology about how we're to identify earthquake prone buildings and that's really quite a stepped methodology um, and it goes into detail about engineering assessment guidelines and also requirements around uh, a national earthquake prone buildings register so as you can, as you can see it's quite a complex um, new system that we've got so who does what under the new system <coughs> in a nutshell um, the council must identify all potentially earthquake prone buildings. Then the owners of those buildings must obtain an engineer's assessment to confirm the status of those buildings. 
they have one year to do that under legislation. Then the council receives all that information, it assesses it and confirms whether that building or those buildings are earthquake prone or not. And if they are, it assigns them an earthquake prone rating. Um, and then the next step, um, the owners have to uh, carry out seismic works on those buildings to address, it, to address the earthquake prone nature of them. So when does all this have to be done by? <coughs> Um, the new system and framework, um, it's prioritised New Zealand under uh, dis different seismic risk areas and that's all based on the risk of buildings in, in an earthquake. Um, high, medium, lows you can see on the map on the left, high in red, uh, medium in yellow and low in green. New Plymouth district is a um, medium seismic risk area and that has implications for when we have to do certain things by and the main ones are up there. The council has um, 10 years or out to 2027 now to identify potentially earthquake prone buildings and then building owners have 25 years to strengthen. As you'll notice, um, there are, those time frames are halved for priority buildings, which I'll get onto next. So our focus to meet those time frames over the next couple of years is uh, on priority buildings. Um, we, want, we need to identify them to meet that time frame of 2022. There are three types of priority buildings. There are important emergency and community buildings. There are buildings that are, have unreinforced masonry and those are on high public use thoroughfares. And there are also buildings that uh, could be located next to transport routes of strategic importance. And that's all about importance in terms of uh, providing an emergency response. So our first step in this process uh, to meet that focus that we've got to identify priority buildings is to align all the building information that we currently have uh, under the new system and framework. We envisage that that's going to take us into uh, next year. And what we, what we intend to do is hold, um, once we've done all that, once we've aligned all that information, we intend to hold a dedicated forum on the earthquake prone buildings process invite all the relevant building owners and all of the stakeholders in the district to, to come and, and, and discuss all the facets of the new process. Um, what, what we envisage uh, as a council is to work closely with um, all the building owners to um, make it nice and smooth through this process to, for, to benefit the district but while meeting the um, requirements of the new system and the process. And that's it. I'll now hand over to Haley to talk about See It in the City. Kia ora koutou. I'm Haley Oliver, your events lead uh, here at Council. I have the privilege of managing the community programs portfolio, including the development of that fantastic brand over there, See It in the City. Council's demonstrated its commitment over the past year by adding a vibrant events programme in the city and we plan to do more in the future. Instead of standing here and boring you to death, what I'm going to do is show you a short video of what we've achieved so far. Free your body and your mind.
we've laid an amazing foundation in one year and we're really looking forward to what we can do in the future with your help. I'd like to now introduce David Langford, our Infrastructure Manager. Uh, kia ora, everybody. My name is David Langford. I'm the Infrastructure Manager for New Plymouth District Council. Um, my role at the council is to, um, to lead our engineering department, look after our roads, our water supply, our parks, get rid of our wastewater, all of the, the really fun stuff that uh, no doubt everybody thinks about front of mind on a daily basis. Um, but look, um, I'm here to talk to you about how our, our infrastructure is really the foundation for our lifestyle capital. Lifestyle capitals don't happen by accident. Um, they take a, a combination of um, vision, some bold aspiration from the community and its leaders, but it also takes a little bit of, uh, of luck as well. And New, P New Plymouth's been shaped by um, its history, its landscape, uh, we're on the banks of the Huatoki. We've had some really great community vision as well over the years. Um, we've had our fair share of luck. It's lucky that we've got oil and gas on our doorstep. It's lucky that we can grow really good ga uh, grass and keep all those cows munching and producing, uh, producing milk um, that supports our GDP and our economy. That means we can make the investments in our lifestyle capital. Um, but there's also a lot of things that, um, that influence us that we can't control. And a few things we can, that we can give little nudges and start shaping our CBD so that we deliver on the vision of the, the blueprint and our district plan. And um, we've got um, some of the work just on the slides here uh, that show that previous work that's been done under the district plan with creating the, the precincts for our city, those areas that have identifiable themes um, and we're in a really good, uh, strong position uh, with a really good pattern for our CBD to work with and build on. Um, so yeah, my role as the infrastructure manager is to turn our district plan, uh, operationalize it, turning into actual action on the ground that you guys will see and experience and hopefully never have to bring to the front of your mind because our infrastructure is there, the foundation that just works that supports our economy, supports your CBD, so that you can get on with your business. And look, one of the biggest challenges for my, of my role is um, we've got a, a district plan that looks ahead for 10 years, but I'm building and designing infrastructure that's designed to last 80 to 100 years. I need to look to the future and try and predict and foresee what's gonna happen beyond even my own lifetime because there's no point investing millions of dollars in infrastructure and then it's obsolete before it even gets to the end of its useful life. And that's a real challenge because there are so many things. If you look back over the last 100 years, the change we've seen socially, uh, economically, and technologically, and those changes are gonna continue and continue to influence our future. Who knows, we could all be um, selling our cars and flying around in Uber taxis and um, the idea of roads becomes an outdated concept. And how, you know, how, do we, how do we forecast that predicted and how do we lay good foundations now that can be responsive to those kind of changes that will inevitably come our way? So look, there's a whole heap of things that are outside of our control. Uh, climate change is going to affect us. Who knows how our economy is going to look in 50 to 100 years' time and um, what's going to happen technologically. 
but then we do have these opportunities that come along the predictable change as our infrastructure reaches the end of its life we go in to renew it these are the opportunities to make the most of that investment and be smart about laying good foundations ready for the future so I'm really quite excited about having a bit of a conversation and we've got some some sketches that are just illustrative, the conversation starters for what our CBD could look like and how do we start shaping and targeting the investment in our CBD so that as we move towards, say, 2050, we're building those foundations that support the vibrant CBD that's laid out in our district plan. So look, I've, I've already mentioned the technological change that's going to uh, likely to occur, particularly around the transport space. And we allocate space in our CBD on our roading network between pedestrians on the footpaths, the cycleways, how much car parking we provide and where we allow cars and buses and those things. And there's a conversation for us to have around how we allocate that space. Can we claim some of it back? Our, our cars are parked 95% of the time and we devote a huge amount of investment and a huge amount of our public space to something that sits there idle and we only use three to five percent of the time is that what we want from our cbd or do we want to start creating more shared spaces more pedestrian only spaces do we want to encourage the cycling and the walking all of those components that you could see forming an integral part of a lifestyle capital where you can walk to work you can be fit and healthy you can be out having a surf at lunchtime and back in the office streetscapes that allow on street dining so after work you can go and have a meal without traffic roaring past you in the cbd is that what we want and i'd love to hear your views on these things um so look yeah our pedestrian net network once you've kind of allocated the space and claimed it how do we build on the successes of our let's go programs where we educate our children in safe walk uh, cycling and scootering because it's our children that are going to be using the cbds in 2050. Um, so let's have a bit of a discussion around how we make the most of the space once we've decided how to allocate it and then there's um this initiative in the CBD uh, in the district plan about greening the CBD so what does that mean and how can we actually realize that in a really constructive way again I refer to some of the changes that I mentioned before climate change is one that's going to influence us greening the CBD in the right way could provide shade so that our CBDs don't get so hot during the summer and they're more pleasant uh, environments to be in um, Social expectations are changing, particularly around how we manage our stormwater. It's starting to get to the point now with new regulation, direction from central government and community expectations that just chucking our stormwater down a pipe to get rid of it and dump it in a river, that's old school technology and it's not good enough anymore. What about treating it so that as that stormwater is picking up contamination from our roads, we're not just throwing that into our natural environment and destroying the lifestyle capital before we've even built it. Is there a space for rain gardens pre-treatment through um, green stormwater solutions that also contribute positively to the urban streetscape so that we've got an enjoyable CBD that people love to be in, that it pulls people in, that they want to walk through, they want to cycle through, they want to walk um, to work in and then get out of the office at lunchtime and after work, come and use your businesses. Um, and love again, love to have that conversation with you get your views on it so that when I'm looking at replacing our roads or digging up the sewers that are getting close to the end of their life and we're relaying those foundations of our infrastructure, we're doing it in a way that sets us up for success for the future. So when you lay it all over, this is just an illustration of what a strategic vision of our CBD could look like. But this is just one of an infinite number of possibilities really love to have that conversation with you around what is our collective vision of the cbd how do we operationalize our district plan and create that lifestyle capital for ourselves so thank you very much thank you david um, so now we've set a bit of the scene here in terms of talking about some of the things that we do, some of the investments we make and some of the tools we have at our disposal. It's now my great pleasure to introduce and hand over to Chris Wilkinson 
from First Retail Group. Chris works nationally and internationally with many towns and cities who are facing the same kind of challenges that we have outlined. And Chris is just going to take us through some of the national and international trends in this space. So over to you, Chris. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, so firstly, thanks to Council for, for having us along to talk. Um, our journey started with uh, New Plymouth. Around three years ago, we uh, started working with Puki Ariki on some of their strategies around visitor experience, their retail and commercial offer, and, and also the eyesight, where that, that market was heading. Uh, subsequently, we worked with the, your team at the, uh, at the airport, and most recently, we've been working with Doc on, um, on the, the visitor centres around New Zealand, of, of which your uh, visitor centre here was one of those projects. We've, we've really come to enjoy our work here in New Plymouth. It's a very unique place. Um, and uh, it's always a bit of a uh, FOMO for the, for the projects we have here because everyone wants to come up and do these. So uh, tonight, one of my colleagues had a prize giving at school, but she, I could see she really wanted to be here and it was a bit of touch and go which one she was gonna go to. Thankfully, prize giving took, it, took the place. So um, who are we? Let me just, uh, let me just tell, tell you about where I'm going to head this morning, uh, tonight on our presentation. So, number one, why should we prioritise CBD performance? We often face that question. Stakeholders are concerned that councils are prioritising support for the commercial sector as opposed to the wider social sector. I'm going to talk a little bit about why the balance is important. Secondly, the global challenges for cities. There are very common themes that are happening across the globe we work in a, in a variety of places around, around the world, and it's interesting to see the similarities, but equally, the challenges that are happening for New Zealand. We've got some unique issues here. Some have been alluded to just, just recently in, in the, the previous presentations. Horizon issues. There are things that are happening overseas that we haven't yet seen here, but we are likely to. So we need to be mindful of these, and I guess the conversations, these early stage conversations we're having now, helps put places like New Plymouth ahead of others that have yet to have these conversations. And for many, they've even, they, they, they're yet to even think about them. So that's the scary part. Opportunities for New Zealand CBDs. We work with most progressive councils in New Zealand and a lot of the ones in Australia and overseas. Opportunities for New Zealand, there are, there are many, okay? So this is not all doom and gloom. Then how do we accelerate and embed that change? We've kind of seen the appetite, just looking across this room tonight and talking to many of the, the stakeholders beforehand, there is that appetite, there is that energy, and there's that capacity in places like New Plymouth. Then I want to talk about New Plymouth's opportunity and then find those key success factors we need to be mindful of uh, in, this, in this journey. So who, who are we? We're a New Zealand-based company. Uh, we're, we're based in Wellington. We have a team that work around the globe. Our, our clients include many of New Zealand and, and Australasia's largest retail brands. We work with many of the councils and, and a number of government departments here. In Australia, we work with the government and many of the large property owners, um, including malls and, uh, and also many of the, the town centres and um, tourism areas. Uh, this is just some projects, some of our team and some of the projects we've been involved in. Uh, the, top, the top large picture. That was a project we delivered for Wellington City Council following the Kaikoura earthquake. So our team were deeply involved in the recovery, the economic resilience program uh, to help the businesses recover. We were also involved in the evacuation of businesses through the, um, in the Tory Street precinct. And we, we delivered the Earthquake Recovery Information Centre on behalf of Wellington City Council and New Zealand government. So we're very proud of that project. Um, We've gone on to deliver a lot of projects that are, uh, that are in quite uh, tenuous circumstances. We do a lot of work in high deprivation areas, uh, areas that are undergoing challenges with major infrastructure work. Um, most recently, we've been working on the Grayland Cycleway, which uh, uh, impacted many businesses. We've been doing some recovery strategies there. So quite a diverse portfolio of work, but one thing we very much love is our work in, in city centres. Um, our background is in retail. We, we, we had a retail chain many, many years ago. We were very lucky to sell the IP of that business. And, uh, and through that, we moved into consultancy in the early 2000s uh, with big projects in the state. So yeah, we, we, we're New Zealand based. We, we get this market and we get the, the challenges that, that these sectors have. 
Why should we prioritize CBD performance? It's a, it's a common question that we will face in almost every project that we're doing. Well, as, as we talked about before, the CBD is a hub. It's a place that people orientate from. It's a community hub. It provides social resilience. The people that come to the CBD, in many cases, they're looking for companionship, they're, looking to, they're, they're meeting each other. There are so many things that a CBD is to so many different people. It's not just a place of commerce. Importantly, it is an economic barometer, and we see so often when big investments are about to happen, the CBD is a focal point for businesses in terms of should we locate there? Should we invest there? So from one extreme, in terms of the, the tens of millions that some businesses are looking to, to place into areas, through to that couple that's looking for a sea change. And that's one of the things that we recognised when we've worked here in New Plymouth, is just how many people are coming here for lifestyle, looking at this place as a sea change, flying in and flying out through the week, but the creative types, the, uh, the, the real spectrum of people that have chosen New Plymouth because of its lifestyle merits. So it's an economic barometer. Then it's an employment centre. It's not necessarily the biggest employment centre, but, but if we look at the wages and, and the opportunities that CBD generates, they're disproportionate. So that's another reason why we need to, need to prioritise for the CBD. They typically are the arts, culture and heritage um, hubs as well, certainly is for, for New Plymouth. And lastly, it's the tourism anchor. So it's the place people orientate back to and it's their, it's their pivot point. And again, very, very similar situation here in New Plymouth. There are global challenges. We, again, we're very lucky. We, we've got projects happening around the world at the moment. We've just been delivering projects in Dubai at one extreme, but then through some of the most um, challenged areas in the UK as well, we've been talking to about a number of projects that are coming up there. Parking is usually the, the first thing that people talk about. I won't talk about parking. We're talking about accessibility because accessibility is important, but it's not about parking, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on. Accessibility is key, and we're seeing some major changes that are happening right throughout, whether it's provincial areas or they are um, city centres, in terms of the way people are perceiving uh, accessibility. But number one is around pedestrian primacy. That's the thing that slows people down and helps them better engage with their environment. So almost every project we have on at the moment, and that is in a wide variety of places across New Zealand and overseas, accessibility is a key focus. Secondly, it's social issues. We do have a lot of, issue, a lot of challenges going on in our city centres. Uh, uh, it's anti-social issues, drugs, etc. Certainly nowhere near as bad as overseas, but we are very, very mindful of that. Safety. We're doing projects in Auckland at the moment looking at the uh, urban design elements that are going to be required as we have these large crowds of people. So again, we were lucky in the last few weeks we've been able to, to visit many of the large cities in the UK to look at the, the things that they're doing around terrorism, so to stop vehicles, and, and again looking at trying to create more pedestrian primacy so that we can keep vehicles out of areas where they could be at risk to people. Resilience. We've worked with the, um, uh, the 100 Resilient Cities program on a number of the cities that they have in their program. That's a really exciting model that places like New Plymouth can take a lot of lead from. Wellington's part of the 100 Resilient Cities program, uh, and when the earthquake did strike, it was interesting because it gave those that were involved in that program a lot of, uh, a lot of um, assurance that there was the mechanisms to be able to recover socially and economically from that. Affordability is another big challenge. So affordability for businesses to open there, affordability for, for people to own properties, that is a big issue across the world. Competition, I could talk about online spending, but I'm actually going to talk about competition because it's not only about online spending. And audience shifts. We're seeing quite a change in, in, in the audiences that our CBDs are, are experiencing now. Again, you know, people living in the CBDs in the week, in, during the weekdays and exiting in the weekends. There's a lot of different dynamics that are going on. Challenges for New Zealand CBD. So, number one, of course, is building resilience. Many of our CBDs have characterful spaces, and those are the types of things that make our CBDs successful. They make them, they make them attractive. 
So we're mindful of the, of, of, the, of the value of those types of buildings to our cities. They're, in many cases, the places that differentiate our CBDs from others and the reasons that people come and, 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 and enjoy those spaces. The suitability of space is another issue. So we talk about those businesses that are escaping and going to, the, to, the, uh, to out of town shopping centres or, or fringe of, city, fringe of area, town areas. So the suitability of space, we need to be mindful that businesses want economically successful spaces, they want uh, environmentally successful spaces, they want the presence, they want the visibility. Those aspects are, are becoming more important now. So as our city centres develop, we need to be thinking about how we can develop some of that within our older, our older precincts. Spending attrition, a massive issue. First thing we look at typically in, in, when we're working in New Zealand, we look at those market view figures because they're very, very telling in terms of what we need to focus on, where our money's going. We're very lucky in New Zealand because a lot of that type of data is transparent and it's a really good litmus test on where, where a city's at. New Zealand has a huge amount of spending attrition. In fact, one of our biggest challenges is that the money that's going offshore, people are buying online and it's going out of the country. Once upon a time, our, our competitors were the guys down the road. Now, typically, it's someone in another country. And that finally, that commercial commitment. So our, our most promising artisan businesses, our most promising up-and-coming uh, entrepreneurs are very cautious today about that commitment. And that's one of the things that, that is becoming a challenge, particularly with property owners that need that commitment. They need that, that lease and, um, and that long term um, for the banks and those types of issues. So we need to be mindful of the fact that we, we, we want to start the succession. Succession's a really important issue for places like New Plymouth. We need both succession in our businesses people that want to, to, to move into these businesses, and then we also need succession in our audiences. So we need to be thinking about where our audiences are now and what it's going to be to bring the audiences of the future into our, into our stores and our, and our hospitality businesses and service businesses. Horizon issues. What's, what's coming up? Okay, retail rationalisation. The likelihood that businesses are going to be looking for maybe smaller spaces or to reduce their footprint in an area. It's something that's happening a lot overseas and it's likely to happen as well here in New Zealand. We can't play down the Amazon effect enough. It, it, it's, it's very, very important that we're mindful of this. What we're seeing again in the UK is that people's first priority when they're looking for goods or services is to look at Amazon. That's the benchmark. And that has been responsible for a lot of the, the retail closures through the UK. Uh, Australia is very mindful of that at the moment. And it's interesting now with Amazon moving into grocery, we're going to start seeing an acceleration of their performance in Australia, which will ultimately uh, come to New Zealand. There are ways to mitigate this. There are ways if we, we, we can be smart and, and, um, and, and protect ourselves. So continued out of town retail and, and food and beverage, yes, it is going to happen. It's something that we can't really do a lot about if, if there's no planning constraints. So it's about enriching our town centres and creating that differentiation and that special experience that will bring people in. And then finally, commercial sustainability. One of the challenges we have at the moment, of course, is these increasing costs. Increasing costs of employing people, increasing occupancy costs, with fairly static growth in terms of spending. In other parts of the world, they're, they're addressing that through self-service, through reducing the, the numbers of people, all kinds of, of, of things. But it's something that we do need to be very mindful of in New Zealand because they're kind of, we're, we're a little bit behind the curve on that respect, in that respect. In terms of opportunities for uh, New Zealand CBDs, I've put this picture up here. Um, this is uh, Invercargill. And, um, Poor old Invercargill, you know, it has been the butt of many, many jokes. Uh, last year we delivered the Invercargill City Centre strategy. Uh, there, there were some major challenges in Invercargill. Uh, a lot of spending potential, um, but it was going out of the, out of the city. Um, a lot of appetite for redevelopment, but no one wanted to make a move. So Council developed a strategy uh, around the CBD, a very confident strategy that was designed to uh, kick some goals into touch, and it did. That strategy came out, and very soon after, the um, the licensing trust, which had been spending quite a long time thinking about their their hotel, 
all of a sudden announced the hotel development and then thereafter there was this cascade of new developments of which one of the uh, largest retail developments is planned and close to being underway in Invercargill, which is the, the redevelopment of a whole block. Um, very lucky in Invercargill to have uh, some, some fairly um, uh, wealthy individuals and families that are very com committed to that area. So it's been interesting to see that's a, a project to watch, with, with, uh, watch very closely. But interesting too is that the challenge that Invercargill had is it had no brand. And because it had no brand, it was vulnerable. So they knew they needed to be audacious in their branding, and um, they developed this thing called Dream Big. It was interesting because the concern was that if they put a brand out that was going to overpromise and yet underdeliver, that would make Invercargill look a bit silly. But in actual fact, that has been the catalyst to give people the confidence to make some, some fairly audacious investment decisions, to um, an investment across a wide range of, uh, of the spectrum. So um, you know you've been successful in branding when people have the tattoos. And that's been very successful. We've had uh, the local tattoo studios done, I think about 20 tattoos now of the Dream Big, including Eddie Dawkins, the cyclist. So um, that's an interesting story to follow and probably quite a good example for a place like New Plymouth where it is an undiscovered gem, and we kind of need to tell that story in a much, much better way. So, opportunities for New Zealand CBDs, market centricity. We need to get our communities leading our, the curation of our town centres and our, and our shopping experiences. We need to get them actively involved. Too often we're dealing with town centres who are saying, we want people to shop local. But there is a process for this. Firstly, you have to get the community involved in telling you what they want. And then those businesses and the town centres need to change accordingly. And when they've changed, only then can you go back and ask for that goodwill. So there is a process here. So market centricity is absolutely vital. Secondly, that daily destination value. Sadly, you don't need to buy a new shirt every day, but you do need to buy a coffee. Um, and so it's, it's making sure that we have these great destinations, these great food businesses. Uh, amongst our retail mix, because retail is no longer the anchor, today it's food and beverage. Then it's clustering. If we can get a critical mass of similar businesses together in one area, we create a really defensible force against the internet. We create that selection, we create that range, we create that convenience. So clustering and mix and delivery is really, really important. Then it's about being able to articulate your culture and the DNA and brand of a, of a city. So we kind of see it, we, we've got to know it and we've got to love it here, but it's really hard to articulate that to other people. And again, I'm coming back to the fact that this is such an undiscovered gem, it's not funny. There's so much potential here, but people don't know about it. And then finally, it's about bringing back the love. It's interesting to see here in New Plymouth, there is a lot of fondness amongst the community for the CBD and, and many of the businesses here. But that's not the case across New Zealand. And it's interesting, we've worked in, in, in a few places um, in the North Island where there's a general hatefulness about the CBD. You know, there's a, there's a disdain and it comes through in a lot of the media and those aspects. So it's really important to kind of, kind of understand the, the dynamic of the community. So it is about asking for community support. That's, that's, right, that's vital. How do we accelerate uh, and embed change? It's about that guardianship focus. So you've got to have the buy-in from your mayor, your elected members, executives and council, business leaders. It's, they're the guardians that we need to be making sure are on board. Unified sectors. We've got a very strong chamber here. Um, very active chamber, very active uh, um, uh, Venture, Venture Taranaki is also very active. So unified conversations that are happening and, and giving pace to that opportunity. Collaboration. Well, we kind of see it tonight. We've got a lot of people here. Clear strategy is really important as well. You know, it's interesting that in many places, councils focus so much on whether it be infrastructure, public realm and all those aspects, but it's also about supporting businesses through that journey. It's not about funding them or anything like that. It's about helping them develop um, cohesion and helping them with um, uh, the success factors. 
Demonstrating success is really important, so we've got a lot of great businesses here in New Plymouth. I think, again, sometimes we're a little bit too close to, to the action to see how damn good they are, but you know, these, they very much are best of class. Not only best of class in New Zealand, but best of, best of world class. So it's important to, to, um, to, to recognise that. And, and finally, it's about looking forward, not backwards. There's nothing we can do about what's gone on in the past, everything we can do about what's, what's going to happen in the future. New Plymouth's opportunity, number one, has to be an aspirational brand. Absolutely. You've got to be able to, to tell that story. People outside this area have to be able to understand it. You want something that can, people can put their hand on their heart and say, um, this is what we're about. Precinct development is absolutely vital as well. I loved what you'd done before. Only thing we'd probably missed out on is a health precinct. You know, we've got an ageing aging population. Those are the kinds of things we need to start seeing as well. The artisanal focus, we've got a fantastic, um, uh, there's a lot of provenance going on here. This is what makes this area special. So that's something that, could, that needs to be worked on even further. Pedestrian primacy, so slowing people down, helping them better engage with the town centre. Uh, accessible and convenient. So we've got to recognise that convenience is a big factor. Otherwise, people will prioritise other destinations. So what are we going to do about making it more convenient to visit and to spend time in the, and, and to prioritise purchases in the CBD. Intergenerational CBD is a really important thing. I, I think that with uh, New Plymouth, we, we, we kind of need to shrink the, 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 the CBD, but we also need to be mindful of the fact that with its opportunities to be able to look at maybe some elder care facilities in the area as well. And the most important thing for New Plymouth is not to be trying to copy anywhere else. It has that potential to what we would call signature livability. It's about being able to um, develop your own themes, develop your own kind of aspirations, and, and, um, and that would be the thing that will set you apart. Just a quick overview of some of the interesting things that, um, uh, that, that are happening around this, around this country at the moment we've been involved with. Uh, Tamaki regeneration, um, Quite a challenging environment. There's 30% uh, deprivation in that area. 30% 30 percent of the uh, the population living in poverty. Big changes happening um, in the town centre. That's been a really exciting project we've been involved with. Um, up in the top corner here, this is one of my colleagues with the Queenstown's town centre czar. Queenstown has got a very um, bullish CBD a strategy that we worked on about three years ago, and Steve Wilde is the town centre czar. He's there to cut through the, all the challenges and make things happen, and, and he very much is. Porora City, a, another place that's um, quite challenged, but it's got a lot going on, and you'll see some big announcements about Porora this week in the news. Uh, Tim, of course, from, um, from Invercargill, needs no introduction. Wellington's our home base. Uh, and we deliver a number of projects there on a retained basis. Um, interestingly enough, one in the, in the, uh, in the community side around uh, civic safety and uh, another one around economic resilience. Then we've got Graylin at the bottom here. Go, read Gore, Gore District Council, which has um, got a goal to be New Zealand's most commercially, um, commercially resilient provincial town. Uh, and they're well on the way to doing that. And again, the common theme here is really strong leadership and a determination to prioritise the CBD. Okay, finally, success factors. Top level commitment, so absolute buy-in by, by your mayor, by your elected members, and the key decision makers in the city. Strategy is very important, okay? And you need a plan, and it needs to be an agile plan because this mar these markets are changing quite, quite quickly. Uh, third, hey, you guys have got this already. In fact, uh, you probably the envy of many of New Zealand's towns and cities. Artisan retail, a supportive community. So from here on, we've got to take the community on this journey as well. They can't be left out. Uh, and then finally, that chamber and economic development um, team buy-in. They've got to be part of the story. This is a... Um, just last week, we were involved uh, finally r wrapping up the, uh, the Graylin um, strategy, and they had a burgers, beer, and brioche party. A couple of hundred people at the, at the local hall. It was pretty amazing, and only in Graylin style. Uh, DJs till late at night. It was very, very cool. And um, 
a lot of places look to, to Greyland as a bit of an icon. It's, it's, it's a place that's very focused on sustainability. It's well ahead of many other parts of New Zealand, but it's just interesting to see there are no cookie cutters to this model. Every place has a different need and a different solution. So, all right, thank you very much, guys. I'm going to move on now, and I'm going to introduce you to uh, David Fleming. So he's been close... Oh, Daniel Fleming, sorry. <laughs> Lucky I'm not staying at his hotel tonight. Um, so <laughs> hey, only because I couldn't get in, guys. This, this, place, is, this place is chocker, um, which does prove that there's some more opportunity. So um, Daniel's been very closely involved in the, in the West End Precinct. He um, uh, came back in 2013 to, to run the hotel. He's the Deputy Chair of the Chamber, <laughs> and he's on the Steering Committee for Barra, the... Uh, the, the group that looks after the CBD as well, and uh, chair of the West End Precinct. So, apologies for the introduction, Daniel, but <laughs> all yours, man. Yeah. Thank you. I'll answer anything. <laughs> <laughs> you say it. Yeah, kia ora katso. Um, yeah, nice to be here, and thanks for the opportunity. And um, yeah, you gave away my secret council name now, so I had Damien going for a while, and now David, and now I think I'll answer to Daniel. So, um, call me what you want, I'll answer. It's all good, but it's great, it great to be here, and obviously, you, you know, we're very passionate about our CBD. We're very passionate about Taranaki, um, and, and particularly the West End Precinct. And so tonight, um, I am here representing the uh, West End Precinct. Um, and, you know, the West End Precinct as our version of Auckland's uh, Britta Mart, uh, Ponsonby Central, or perhaps Federal Street, just without the street, but we're working on that one, so we'll get there. Now, 25 years ago, uh, Russell Boddington purchased a piece of land that no one else was interested in. The real estate sign had been there for so long it was torn, and the real estate agent who actually worked for the company um, had then retired. Um, that site is now where Ozone Coffee Roasters currently stands, an international coffee business stretching from New Plymouth to London. The White Hart Hotel was a place to avoid unless you're a bikey, or, uh, you know, it was a rough part of town where you had to be kind of brave or crazy or both, um, unless you liked the, was the band Sticky Filth that used to play there a bit, beyond my before my time, of course. Um, now, thanks to Jeremy Thompson and uh, Harvey Dunlop and the Boddington and McFarlane families, um, you know, it's one of the most desirable parts of, of New Plymouth, we believe, and is well known around the country. So the West End Precinct comprises of 20 businesses, so obviously the King and Queen Hotel, where I spend most of my day and my night, um, but not limited to just that, you know, the White Hart restaurants, bars and cafes, um, such as Public Catering, Snug Lounge, um, Monica's Eatery, Friedrich's Social Kitchen, um, TSB Showplace and the Lean Life Centre, most of these around King and Queen Streets, but certainly not limited by those streets, more about quality um, and fit. Um, so private and public partnership um, is what has been, and, and certainly more importantly will be, uh, required to ensure its ongoing success. Along with the more obvious bricks and mortar growth, um, a strong brand has been created. And just over two years ago we established that brand. And the idea was to brand the neighbourhood as a destination within a destination. One which would draw in visitors um, you know, from outside of Tanaki and one for locals to be really proud of. And when we launched, we had a national um, media visit, so we drew in uh, the likes of the Herald and Denzin, uh, Fashion Quarterly and, and Urbis, um, and clearly sort of targeting a, a fashion-focused, um, art-enthusiastic and food-loving clientele. Um, so today we've got a PR and marketing team um, that help keep the brand alive and they organise a range of events and, and promotions um, in the area and we've been fortunate enough to have a, a lot of journalists visit the West End Precinct um, internationally and, and nationally um, and, and most recently the Quarter magazine named the West End Precinct as one of the top three um, experiences when coming to Taranaki which we found to be really, really humbling. Um, so the West End Precinct is now a, a hub that offers the, the best sort of high-end accommodation um, cuisine, coffee, art, retail, um, and entertainment, which is envious to, to many other uh, provincial cities in New Zealand. And this has only been possible through the collaboration of like-minded people um, with strong um, individual but cooperative skill sets. Um, so what does the future hold for the West End Precinct? I do have just one, um, one photo up there. Um, nicely packed in, but uh, you know, we're on an exciting journey to double the size of the West End Precinct over the next four years. Um, so stage one is adding on an additional six rooms to the current King and Queen Hotel, and that will start within the next three months. Um, followed by a development on Queen Street, 
um, including the relocation of ozone coffee roasters um, to a new premises. And then in a year and a half, we're building a, a big development, which is a six-storey development on the existing ozone coffee roasters. And, and that will have uh, inner-city living, um, apartments that will sell, um, a further extension to the hotel, um, and then a really exciting retail um, and food and beverage um, addition to the precinct along with car parking. And we're hoping that uh, this development will encourage further investment around the CBD, um, particularly in our surrounding neighbourhoods for a start. So why has the West End Precinct been successful to date? Well, number one, it's been around collaboration, and we throw that word around a lot, but it really has been around great landlords, developers, operators, um, and council have worked together in a really uh, civic-minded um, way. And, and number two, we have a really top people working in the area, um, co-owners, general managers, um, housekeeping, baristas, you name it. And, and we've, uh, I suppose we're fortunate to have a team of specialists um, and, and maybe coffee, hotels, art, beer. Um, and I know um, firsthand that the team have really given everything to this, um, even uh, along with their own hangovers, caffeine overdoses, um, and, and loss of diets to make sure that the level of quality is, um, is where it needs to be. Um, so our visitors can enjoy it, and obviously um, us as locals get to enjoy it too. Um, but on a more serious note, you know, really passionate group of people um, behind the scenes have worked really hard um, to achieve something awesome. Um, you know, where people's skill sets are, are fully um, utilised um, and, and really relied upon. And number three, hubs do work. Um, focusing on one area at a time um, you know, has really been successful rather than trying to tackle the whole city in one go. Um, and we believe, you know, you must have a strong heart to have a functional body, um, you know, with key assets, both public and private. Um, now, we believe that sort of we've, we've recreated that heart of the city once more. Um, and, and number four, brands are really powerful. They're emotive, they're engaging, um, they bring people to the area, and of course they educate um, people on, on what we do best. So what could have been done better? Well, underneath the success, some um, challenges had to be overcome. Um, if we're able to solve some of these problems over time and make investment in our CBD more attractive, uh, then New Plymouth can really thrive. And um, you know, the key is to make life easier for developers um, without compromising civic duties. And we've had some great success in the West End Precinct, um, but this hasn't come without some big challenges, um, and these remain ongoing. Um, we must be careful tonight that we don't enthusiastically um, challenge each other to, uh, on what we would like to see, only to find it can't be done. So it's looking at, at how do we solve some of these simple things too. Um, and another challenge is capital investment um, and getting projects over the line. You know, Chris talked about um, compliance costs and, and engineering standards. Um, you know, construction costs are high, um, you know, and, and costs and, and, and delays in construction can be expensive. Um, with all that taken into consideration, we still need to be brave. Um, and good examples are the building of the hotel, the Len Lye Centre, uh, and the White Hart Restoration. And now, fingers crossed, the Queen Street streetscape. That was just an easy one to chuck in there. <laughs> um, success breeds success, and we've seen some great projects get pushed over the line in the West End Precinct um, due to the confidence of what else has been created in the area. Um, so, you know, leadership in that space is, is really important, and, and you know, particularly at a, at a civic level as well for the elected members. Um, and, you know, support is required. Um, in order for our CBD to prosper, um, we require partnership with both public and private. In order to allow all areas like the West End Precinct to grow, we need to create a business-friendly environment and a building-friendly environment. And we need to cut the red tape where we can. The cost and time of compliance is slowing down development. And we've made good progress, but let's make it easier for developers to do what they do best. We're here tonight to talk about the resurgence and the revitalisation of our CBD. It is currently dying in some areas, and it is dying because of technology and consumer changes, regulation, compliance, and construction costs. But the West End Precinct has shown um, that you know, the heart of the body is beating strong. So let us tonight start a process that builds on this beating heart so our CBD can flourish in 2050. And it will just leave you with some questions that, that we really had. Um, how can we create more hubs like the West End Precinct and New Plymouth CBD over time? And when is the right time? How can we encourage more investment and make the building process easier for developers? And how can we make New Plymouth CBD the place to invest in regional New Zealand? Thank you so much.
Ciascuno. Kia ora everybody. My name is Katrina Brunton. I'm the Customer and Regulatory Solutions Manager here at New Plymouth District Council. Um, so look, we've heard from a great number of speakers this evening and what I would say to you is uh, the vision that David talked about and that he's inviting you in to have that conversation uh, with him about is what the Mayor is challenging us all on. He came to me um, about a month ago, maybe a little bit longer, and uh, Sean Basic, and said, hey look, we need to have a conversation with our CBD people. Uh, Katrina, get on and do it. So I'd like to say thank you very much for coming. Um, it's been a fabulous turnout. And David's vision that he prepared for you um, is aspirational. And it's a conversation that we want to continue and uh, not simply be a fait accompli. We want your ideas. We also asked you to send us uh, your top three questions and audacious goals, and we have been inundated. Um, and so I would say thank you about that. And I don't want to keep you all night. So I am going to put all of that together, and I'm going to send it out to all of you. Uh, the Mayor is going to call on you to contact him if you want to be involved in these conversations going further. This is just the beginning. In terms of the, co the questions that we have, uh, I'm going to ask... Uh, Councillor Beasick, Councillor, uh, His Worship the Mayor, sorry, and Chris to answer some of these. We can't go through all of them tonight, there are too many. Um, but there is some key themes. Um, and so I'm going to start with one, uh, thank you Chris Hurley, I'm going to refer to yours first. Um, Chris says, I hope you don't mind me mentioning your name by the way. <laughs> He says, is there a small regional city elsewhere in the world that is successful in its CBD regeneration? I have had the benefit of talking at length with Chris about this, and so I would like him to talk to you about that uh, just a little bit, mindful that we um, are at quarter to eight. It has gone a bit longer, and I apologise for that. Fantastic. So I won't keep you guys, because I know I'm probably between you and bed, but the... One of the places we've spent some time visiting in the last couple of weeks is, is a place called Shrewsbury uh, in the UK, which has made some really interesting uh, moves around their CBD. One of the key things is that the, the council, which is very, very progressive there, has been encouraging some private and public sector investments as, as, as key shifts to encourage major regeneration. Not only that, they've spent a lot of time and money on all of the public realms, so it's a, it's a major redevelopment. But what was noticeable is that the town was busy. The town's stores, if they were empty, they were being refilled again, and that contrasted so much with many of the UK towns we visit, and we, we, we spend a lot of time both looking for the best and the worst out there to, to be able to get some good experience from. So talking to council, a, a huge appetite amongst them for success of the CBD, that recognition uh, that the CBD was an important part of that wider economy. Get that right and everything else will come with it. Get that wrong and you'll be forever chasing your tail. So a, a really good example, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of information on Shrewsbury that you can get online. Um, there's a lot of discussion around there around their town centre rejuvenation, their uh, regeneration, plus um, they've got a lot of stuff around their bid, their business improvement district that's also been working around driving that. So the search things would be Shrewsbury Town Centre Regeneration, um, the Midlands Engine, which is the uh, economic funding mechanism, and Shrewsbury Bid, which is working to differentiate that town centre. Thank you, Chris. Um, Daniel has asked, Will the council purchase and remove old buildings and turn them into green space or new buildings? So there is no strategy um, that we have in place. Sorry, I'm going to answer this one <laughs> because, because I know the answer. Um, 
And so at this point in time, we don't have a property strategy of council getting in there and buying buildings and turning them into green space. But what you will have seen in David's um, vision was a whole lot of green in places. Now, every square that was green on that plan is currently a car park. So in 2050, and we need to really contemplate that number, and I have had to do that quite a lot lately, I will be 70. Um, and I'm hoping that I'll be retired and no longer driving to work um, and that I will be able to sit somewhere on a green space in a sunny spot and have a coffee rather than look at uh, asphalt or cobble. And so that's about what do we want in 2050? And it doesn't need to be council that buys those buildings to redevelop um, because ultimately it doesn't need to be buildings. It's just about looking at the spaces that we have and how we can use them better. On the back of that, I will add that I've been working really closely with the Boddingtons and the McFarlands Group and the West End Precinct and their Kings and Queens redevelopment, and they have pushed me. And something they said to me was, and I have kept reminding myself about this, Katrina, we don't want you to be developer. We just actually want council to do what council does well, provide the services, develop the roads, make them look good, and we'll do the rest. And that's what council is about. It's about delivering the public infrastructure and then as partners you guys deliver the rest. I'm going to move um, a few pages over. Um, Reeve Barnett sent in some questions. Uh, he said, retail has changed with CBDs losing their retail aspect throughout regional New Zealand and overseas. What vision does the council have with respect to the makeup of the CBD being in years to come? I wonder if our councillors might have some view about that. I'm really putting them on the spot. Thank you, Katrina. Um, yeah, well, a vision for me personally for the CBD is is really just one that's vibrant, but as Katrina said, I think I'll probably be around the seven. I haven't done the maths, I don't want to do the maths. Um, that when you that you can go in there, you can have a good coffee, you can buy, have some retail therapy, or just a place where you can relax or, or meet people. So, um, yeah, it's a good question thing on the spot. Um, but definitely, it needs to be that heart, it needs to be that Daniel talked about of cultural hub. Um, you know, I remember the days of the White Heart being um, what it was actually, probably spent a bit of time there, it was good. Um, but yeah, it, it's just about those different, for me as CBDs, we, all that comes together. You know, we're all the different streams of, of um, economics, of, you know, businesses, you know, different businesses, different retail, um, but also different cultural aspects as well. You know, you've got the art with the... Um, you know, with the Lean Live, but also, you know, the music side of things and, you know, venues for, for live music and stuff like that. That's what I like to see that happen. Neil, do you want to add anything? I might have a little one. Um, uh, yeah, look, uh, one, I think we're slaves to the automobile and that's got to go, and it will, over time. Um, and I think that um, we're, we're getting older and we're getting fatter um, and we're spending far too much time on screen. So if, if you were to ask me what's the 2050 CBD, I imagine. Um, one, that we have a really clearly defined Eastern Precinct as well. Um, I actually, talking to a wonderful man, I'm not sure if he's here, but Anand Rose, um, talked about that kind of a more of a bohemian thing going on down that end and, and the, the kind of artists and the hipsters. Um, and, and then really in that centre, you know, if you said, if I, if I got to draw the picture, um, that that it would become this, we would it would become that education and energy hub. So that's where we're really basically bringing in. We've got all of those. We've got that that kind of business precinct of the energy sector, but then creeping into town and crossing the lines between the commercial and the education. I think um, for me that the the key thing is that we've we've got a couple of constraints. Um, in terms of we've got this massive highway to the port sitting right there and the rail network but potentially 
we can work around those and and if we defined you know we've we've done a fantastic job in the western precinct but we've got to look at okay what's the eastern going to be about and what's the centre going to be about and then that will give the building owners the ability to kind of say right where do we want to go um, but for me that I suppose the last bit of it is I think that we need to see more people living in there um, if we want to be less slaves to the automobile we need to bring the people to the town and then that's going to drive that um, and I think Chris mentioned it the day-to-day -day visitors and those are what those are what businesses can bank on that repeat custom that person that comes down and I mean I used to work with Alanga Ekanyaki and I think he did buy a shirt a day where he certainly there was a lot of those factory creases um, that we saw so if we've got if we can create a CBD where people actually want to live and enjoy then they are going to spend money because they're going to form relationships with the businesses and it's those relationships that will actually that will, will actually drive the growth and confidence so the CBD um, vision of course as David says is operationalizing the district plan and the district plan will drive the land use they are sending through the policy team and Juliet are sending a really strong signal through the district plan about uh, mixed use development in our CBD in order to get more people in. Um, I know that the questions that I received from the guys at Johnson Corner was about that and we'd really love to have a conversation with you on that. Please don't think because I haven't raised your questions tonight that we have ignored them, we will not. Um, and overwhelmingly you will not be surprised that the majority of you want to talk about parking. Um, can we have more car parking? car parking, can we have less car parking, can we charge for car parking at night, um, you know all sorts of varieties around car parking. So I'm going to let all of the panel members talk to you about car parking. It's not that we hate the P word but we just kind of know what's coming. So one of the challenges with parking, of course, is that, that, that there is this perception that it is, that it is absolutely vital to the success of business. It's not necessarily. We've got many studies that will prove that, uh, and particularly the market view studies, which look at when we've, we've played with towns, we've taken parking charges down or removed them, um, that things have transformed. Interestingly enough, we've just been working in Wellington where after many years of not free parking but subsidised parking, because it's actually come from people's rates, um, the parking charge has been applied back onto the weekends. And what's been really useful to see is the turnover that that's creating now. So people have more confidence that they can come into town and they will find a park. We're finding that consumers are changing their, the ways that they're shopping. They're being more purposeful, so they're coming into town knowing what they want. We're looking, we're working with councils now to look at more short-term parking areas, so 10 minutes where people can duck and get their coffees and then head back out again. So there's a lot of different ways of skinning the cat in this, in this respect. So, um, and it's definitely not a one size fits all, but free parking is not the be all or end all. Um, there are many other ways of doing it, and I think that for a place like New Plymouth, we kind of need to, to, to do some, we need to try things out. Um, I'll just quickly round back to that last, that last question in terms of what would be the future. The reality is that New Plymouth could be New Zealand's most consumer-centric town, city. All the way through this journey, you need to be talking to the community to find out what they want, and then overlaying that with best practice and trends. So, there is some real opportunity for New Plymouth to be so very different in the way it approaches its town and its city centre. Parking. Mm. Um, so my idea of parking is parking should be agile. Um, and I'd like to see um, a council not focus too much on the revenue of parking. The problem we've got, the revenue of parking offsets rates. So as soon as you adjust it, you get the ratepayers a little bit upset because the, the rates go up. And they see it as a subsidy, whereas actually it's the parking that's subsidised. So um, my vision would actually be that the parking revenue is used back in the source from where it comes from, which in, in this case will be the CBD. But also that it's agile. You know, we've got a system now that we can look and see which parks have the highest turnover, are used the most. And I think on average it's only like 42% um, 
occupancy of our parking. So adjust the rates in order to get um, to get higher occupancy. Um, so that's how I would see parking be utilised, and also a, a more fair use of parking. Um, you know, at the moment we've got a concentration of nine to five charges, but the CBD doesn't stop at five o'clock. So I'd like to see a more even usage of of parking, which how that looks dollar wise or anything like that. No expert on that, but um, definitely a more agile system is what I see. We need to adjust it without worrying too much about the end effect on on the rates. Um, but that's a journey that we need to we can't do overnight, unfortunately. Oh, parking hell. Do I want another term? Um, <laughs> I. Uh, Look, my view is really, yeah, I certainly agree with Sean in terms of, I look at the revenue that comes from parking over time that we need to reinvest that into the CBD. I'm aware, acutely aware that commercial um, rates are significantly higher than residential um, and that, that there is, in my view, um, you know, while our CBD has good bones, it's looking a bit tired. You know, I, I like the idea of taking the revenue from an area and using that to reinvest in the area in the hope that it drives drives more revenue. Um, but I really think um, the key to us was saying, well, what are the businesses um, that around town see as the gap? So, yep, look, we've all heard that I want um, everything from an hour free to everything free, and I think there's $2.4 million or about 3% of rates if we were to do that. Um, but where's the evidence that that will work? Um, but also, you know, I, I had um, Mr. Clegg and Mr. Eckdale popped in to, to, to speak with um, Alan Melody and, and Sean and I and said, well, you know, there's a restaurants, a lot of restaurants that traditionally used to do just sit down meals are now doing takeaways. Um, and depending on what time we get out of here, um, I might be wanting to go and grab one. I'm a big fan of um, uh, Cafe Turkey, um, but I always end up parking about a block away because, you know, basically, from five o'clock at night, it's just chocker. So I think you know where we want to go is is we're looking at what the trends are and saying, well, how do we help those businesses make more money? How do we help them connect with their customers? What are the what are the things we can do so that what I would like is instead of the conversation being council wants to impose X, that actually it's the community's told us we want Y. And the reason for it is data point A, data point B, data point C. We need to get our customers want access, um, or our customers tell us if you do this, they will come in more often. And we will we'll do that piece of work based on the data, and then we'll have a look and where we're at in six months. And with, with this better systems, we can do that. And I think that's where I think this is about the start of a conversation, and we want to talk to you about how we continue this conversation because I think it's about refinement. I mean, my goal is that we close the gap between council and businesses um, so, that, so that you can actually see your ideas manifested in our plans. So, um, as you've just heard His Worship the Mayor, he says he wants to start a conversation with you. I am mindful that it is 8 o'clock, and um, I know if you're like me, your bed is calling. Uh, it's been a long day. So if there are any burning questions that you really have to uh, um, want answered now, I'm more than hoping, happy to throw that open to the floor. Um, but ultimately the Mayor has put out the call. Do you want to r reiterate that? I'll do one last challenge and then we'll take a couple of questions. The goal is, um, in the short term, we'd like um, the different sectors to aggregate up and give us a couple of people from each area. To, so that we've got a smaller group so that we can sit down and do some in-depth work. So that's our challenge to you, is if you consider yourself a sector and you communicate with your peers, come back to us with a couple of people. I'm not going to tell you who your leaders are or who, who should represent you. You do that. But we want, you know, we, want, we want people from the design space, the art space, we want the retail space, the development space, the property ownership space, so that we can get a group of about 12 people, 14 people together that reflect the people that you want to lead the conversation and be the connection. We will aim to do these events periodically and, and have them more interactive. We do plan to survey you, we do plan to provide information and keep the conversation going. But I suppose that's my, my first challenge because we can simplify it that way, um, and now it's 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 over to you. So, um, 
I am a public servant. I have 80,000 managers, so command me, oh great one. Um, so our first question from Mr Goldsmith over here. Just wait Just coming with the coming. speaking <laughs> stick. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you everybody this evening. I, I'm impressed with precincts and um, hubs. Um, I have a, not a question to council, I plead to council. You tend to work in a silo, your officers do. Um, and the, you need a, a substantial forum and it needs to be regular and it needs to go to 2050 because it is a moving target and it, it's for years that that forum has been missing in this big conversation about talking about the urban environment and the working environment for businesses. It's very fine when the West End developers come along and talk to council, but that is a, that is a silo. That's a conversation, it's a silo. It is not um, articulated across the community, and that's fine for that working party, but we need to articulate the story of how these cities work. And that's always been lacking. It's been lacking. The media haven't dealt with it. The council hasn't dealt with it. And the officers don't d deal with it. And, and, and writing policy into local body... Uh, district plans um, without the articulation and conversations is very problematic. Um, another plea to council, please establish an urban design review panel and then you will get the sector and it will work over developments and assist the whole development of your and, and enrich your CBD. It's been lacking for 25 years, other cities do it and with great results. So please, two things. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any other questions out there that um, you're burning, you're di dying to ask? Go to Katoa. Um, my name is Justin. I um, work with supporting families and mental illness. Chris, you mentioned a health precinct. I'd be very interested to hear more about what that would look like. Sorry, it's not a question, but um, as we work, I work with uh, individuals with um, mental illness or addiction and support their families, it'd be interested to bring that aspect into the overall um, Wyota and recognition that it's important for um, our well-being overall. A absolutely. So any of the forums we would be running in terms of the town city centre, we have a very strong balance between commercial side and also the community side, the social sector. It's very, very important. We know we are facing some quite major challenges in our town and city centres uh, and, and, and they need to be dealt with. But one of the big issues we're seeing, of course, is the ageing population. And so we need to firstly integrate the ageing population with our, you know, get them active, get them amongst our town centres because they will be the future consumers as well. We're dealing with a number of projects right now where we're looking at this huge escalation in those age groups that we need to manage. And part of that is actually bringing those health services together, um, uh, going wider than those traditional health services. So uh, the, the project in East Hamaki is a really good example of that where they will bring um, a wide range of health and wellness services and social services together. Um, which will make it more convenient for people and will also help activate those businesses around there and potentially create accommodation and other factors. So very, very important. One final question, I think. Um, I just wanted to add on to the um, health precinct. I think there's one really developing already in Vivian Street and Fulford Street because you've got all your so many medical places there, physios, what yes, these, these, tend, these tend to develop, um, in many cases, there's actually an appetite amongst the health, health sector right now to drive these. So we're actually seeing the health sector in many ways are driving, other, in other cases it's the DHBs, but uh, either way it needs to be a priority for every town and city. Okay, thank you for that Chris, and I think um, we, we'll draw to a close now. Um, as the Mayor has indicated, uh, this is the start of a conversation, so watch this space. The invitation, the challenge has gone out, and so we look forward to talking with you again. And if I could ask um, Trent and Martin to um, close our proceedings off appropriately.
Akira no Tato. It's been excellent just to listen to all the the corridor that's been going on within the CBD area. We will be involved very much so down in our port area. Thought I'd get my five cents in just then. However, we're willing to play. Wakatakatahau ki te uru, wakatakatahau ki te tonga, kia mā kina kina ki uta, kia mā taratara ki tai, kia hiake ana te atakura he tio, he huka, he hauhu, tihei mauriora. Kia ratatau. Thank you and thank you everybody. <laughs>